trailing vapor and smoke. Mm. Pieces are flying off. You can see them off to the side. And then they plummet to earth. This one of the debris sites near Fort Worth, Texas. And I was saying earlier, Russ Mitchell, that you see this debris site in Fort Worth, Texas, then hundreds of miles to the east near Nacogdoches over in the general area of the Texas-Louisiana border. Uh, all kinds of reports of debris there. And NASA, I don't know officially, but people at NASA have emphasized that there may be debris, uh, you know, as far as Louisiana, perhaps Arkansas. Uh, it's just that it's going to be spread over a very wide area, which, again, this is the third time, I think at least the third time, we're showing you this amateur uh, video that was taken. I'm not quite sure from where this video was I'm taken. Sure. Somewhere uh, in North Texas. Also, they, again, authorities say if you come in contact with this, don't touch it. It could be very dangerous. I think we, we want to go to Bill Harwood, our CBS News space expert who's been so magnificent in reporting this story this morning. There's no other word that describes it. Before doing so, I think that we should um, re-rack that video one time. Uh, this is the best available evidence we have of what happened to the shuttle and just let it play for a minute. Well, I was hoping that we could uh, rack that from the top and let it play, but here it is. Dan, this is Bill Harwood. Can you hear me? Lump in your throat time. As the path of the shuttle to Earth is clear, we go down to Bill Harwood in Florida. Bill? Dan, it's terrible to watch that. Uh, one thing that I'm struck by watching it, occasionally you can see a bright reddish flash that's very characteristic of the kind of fuel the shuttle carries igniting. Hypergolic fuels, when they burn or when a launch blows up here from the Air Force on an unmanned rocket, they always talk about the big red cloud, and that's, that's very indicative of fuel tanks on board the shuttle, maneuvering fuel tanks, uh, coming apart in the atmosphere and the fuel igniting. Uh, that's, uh, that, red, that red flash is, is hardly, un, hardly, you can't mistake it for anything else. Bill Harwood. Uh, Dan, if I could, I, surely, just please. very quickly, I wanted to point out the only thing we've heard all morning, or even thinking about that was out of the ordinary, is this foam from the external tank falling and hitting the leading edge of the left wing shortly after launch. Bill, uh, not, excuse me for interrupting, but sure. uh, uh, people would say foam on the tank. That foam yeah, was to insulate for the heat? That's exactly right. You know, these are super cold propellants, hundreds of degrees below zero, and the orange look of the tank, the actual outer few inches of the tank, is a foam insulation that, that looks orange. A piece fell off during launch and hit the left leading edge of the wing. There's a tremendous amount of heat on those leading edges during entry, right about the point where they lost contact. You cannot help but wonder, and again, no one likes to speculate in an aerospace accident because the first impressions, as you've said repeatedly, are often incorrect. Uh, but certainly it's something we want to keep in mind as they look through the data and the telemetry, um, is to find out if that could have possibly had any impact today. Just simply because if there was an area of damage and the kind of heat they see on entry, that, that could, in theory, be a factor here. Well, Bill, we want to bring in uh, Dr. Ed Crawley of uh, MIT Aeronautics and uh, Aer Aeronautics Chairman at MIT. Dr. Crawley, can you give us some uh, observations that might put this in context for us? Well, Dan, uh, this video that uh, we've seen now on se from several different angles will be a very important uh, piece of evidence. You might remember that after the Challenger accident, where video was in fact an, an important in the accident investigation, there was a uh, decision to have even more and higher quality video at the time of launch. And this particular video, you can see it right there, there's a little piece of something that falls off early, and just about in here, this, the spacecraft appears to, uh, to, to bloom. 
as if the attitude of the spacecraft changes and here we see what appears to be uh, other parts of the spacecraft on independent tracks. Uh, so they'll, they'll go back and replay this uh, video frame by frame hundreds of times to see if they can uh, discern from this what that first little bit coming off of might have been, what the sequence of events was to see if they can get any flight dynamic information, to see if they can, they can filter the, the video to see if they see the nose pitch up or pitch down. Uh, to, to try and develop an understanding of the sequences of events here. Dr. Crawl, if you'll uh, hang in there with us in Boston and Bill Harwood in Florida, also hang on as we play this uh, amateur video again, which is going to be a strong piece of evidence for the investigation by NASA. On the telephone with us now is Mr. Doug Haviland, who is the uncle of Columbia astronaut Laurel Clark. Uh, Navy Commander Laurel Clark, a medical doctor, was a rookie astronaut that is making her first flight. I want to point out that Mr. Haviland's son was killed at the World Trade Center on 9-11. Mr. Haviland, thank yeah. you for being with us this morning. Tell us about your niece, Laura Clark. Well, she was accepted in the uh, space program, became an astronaut. She was very enthused about it. This is what she wanted to do, and uh, she was dedicated to the task and uh, she knew the risks that were there but uh, she felt that uh, they were very safety conscious and uh, and this is what she really wanted to do how proud you must be of her yes the whole family is uh, um, my sister her mother is in Arizona and she had her misgivings I think but uh, she was really proud of Laurel as taking this on well, naturally, members of the family would have their misgivings. Did you ever hear uh, the commander, Laura Clark, talk about her misgivings or the danger of the flight? Uh, well, uh, but she felt that, uh, you know, NASA was so safety conscious that uh, she uh, did not live in dread or anything like that, I'm sure. Uh, Last night I picked up uh, on the internet the uh, email that she had sent back to Earth uh, just uh, shortly before uh, this all happened. And she starts out, hello from above our magnificent planet Earth. The perspective is truly awe-inspiring. This is a terrific mission and we are very busy doing science round the clock. And uh, so that expresses her attitude, I think. As to, uh, how she felt about what she was doing. We thank you very much for being with us, and we offer our condolences to you and the members of the family, as we do to members of all the families of the seven astronauts aboard this flight, including six Americans and one Israeli. Thank you, Dan. I'll repeat something that Colonel Mike Mulhane, a veteran and now retired astronaut, said earlier. He said he was, quote, terrified at all three launches in which he took part. He said once past the launch, that there was no doubt in his mind that that's the most terrifying moment. Now, perhaps it was the most terrifying moment for because other reasons that Challenger had exploded in 1986, just 73 seconds after launch. But on launch, as Colonel Mulhane described it to us uh, here at CBS this morning, there's this tremendous sound, tremendous quaking that's the proper verb uh, of the uh, space shuttle, uh, that even a brave man like Colonel Mohane, a veteran, uh, uh, always terrified him, he said. But he said, once in orbit, it was relaxing. He described a kind of floating sense and no sense of danger in orbit way up there on the high frontier. Then he said there was some apprehension at the time of reentry, some apprehension, but he said it was basically no big deal and that what he was feeling on all three flights, once they got to the point where the shuttle was today, or something similar in case they landed in California, the long glide toward home that will go so quickly, he said he was thinking of just how tired he was and how glad he would be to get to sleep. If that gives us uh, any perspective on what these brave astronauts who are now gone may have been thinking and experiencing today.